Hey, Jason Andrew here. You know when you get that masculine urge to do epic business shit? Well, I've been studying businesses that grow by mergers and acquisitions. And you know what? I've got that itch. That masculine urge to do a roll-up of SMBs. I'm here to scratch that itch with the guy of roll-ups, Dr. Glenn Richards. You may have heard of Glenn. He's the founder of Green Cross Vets, a roll-up of vet clinics, a chairman of Healthier, a healthcare roll-up. He's also a director of a bunch of other companies, which I'll let him share with you. Glenn's also a shark. Yep, you might recognize him from his time as a panelist and investor on Australia's Shark Tank. In this pod, we're talking all about roll-ups. No, not the fruity lunchbox treat you had as a kid. We're talking about a rolling up of SMBs. You know the playbook, buy a bunch of small businesses, whack them together, take it public and make a shit ton of money. Sounds sexy, right? Well, it turns out it's actually harder than you think. All right, let's get to it. Glenn, hi. Hey, Jason, how are you? Yeah, good. Listen, you're kind of a big deal in Australia. Um, you're probably most well known for founding Green Cross Vets in mid 90s, late 90s, 1994, uh, where you grew kind of one vet clinic into a roll up of 160, I think I read. Um, at its peak in 2007, it was doing about 900 mil of turnover. Mm -hmm. uh, it was then taken private by TPG, which we can talk about later. Um, but now you're the chairman of Healthier, which is another roll up of, um, I guess, health businesses and allied health, including podiatrists, physios, optometrists. Uh, which is also ASS listed and is also looking to be taken private by another private equity <laughs> firm. Uh, also a director of several other businesses, uh, ASS listed people in, which is a roll up of services, recruitment, labor hire Correct. type things. Uh, Naturo Food Companies, which is like a, a food tech Play. type company. Yeah. Adventure Holdings, which is a what, acquirer of outdoor leisure brands. Yeah, Camping Leisure, Oztrail is our, our sort of lead brand. Okay, yeah. Does Very well. familiar with Oztrail, yeah. So. Um, anyway, Glenn, safe to say you love a roll-up. Absolutely. <laughs> love a roll-up. I'm excited to have this conversation with you because uh, and I'm a business and finance dork and I enjoy studying companies that grow through mergers and acquisitions. So thrilled to have this conversation with you. Um, so thanks again for being here. So can we start, can you explain what is a roll-up? I suppose in the simplest terms, Jason, as you can probably lecture me on, is you know, consolidation of uh, a bunch of small businesses into one larger business and generally um, there will be a geographic um, sort of network that's associated with the, the roll-up. So you're adding small businesses into a, into a large pool. Um, I, I want to lead really loudly because, you know, I spent a long time trying to educate the investment community around Green Cross, you know, basically eight to ten years um, going door to door, convincing investors that if you do it well, have the right people for the right reasons with the right model, you can make a success of roll-ups. And a lot of, there's been some spectacular failures uh, in Australia. And uh, we came on the back of things like Hearts Accounting falling over and, and a whole bunch of other, what I call roll-ups, even people in the veterinary industry had tried and failed. Um, so I still argue loudly that you've got to do it for the right reasons. Add value to your customers and add value to your employees, add value to that individual business. Uh, you've definitely got to be authentic and, and bring your people on that journey of why bringing a whole bunch of little businesses together under a common ownership or a, and I won't go all the way to say a common brand because we have done that in the past. Uh, I guess with Healthier, we got a, a house of brands play going on at the moment yeah. rather, rather than a branded house. Uh, but, but some sort of synergy around how you talk to customers is important. Um, and it's got to seriously add value to your customer's life as well. Um, so, you know, just slamming a whole bunch of businesses together, putting a big rat, you know, ribbon around them yeah. and presenting them to investors is just wrong. And that's gone on and on so many times. Isn't that, that's the way I think about roll-ups. So I'm, you know, if I'm a guy looking to make a quick buck, you know, tuck a, tuck a, a small group of SMBs together, list it, make a bit of money. Isn't that, isn't that the playbook by private equity? Well, I think, Private equity have learnt and learning pretty fast that you do it the right way. You create a legacy rather than just something that's that's short, sharp. There's a quick buck. You, your EBITDA, your profit line looks okay for a while, but you haven't done the proper work on culture, uh, platforms, IT, education. Uh, you know, putting decent KPIs and coaching methods into that business. When you do it right, with the right funding team it can be really powerful. When you do it wrong and you're in and out for a quick buck and, and you can do it, you know, people do it and they always fall off afterwards. Yeah. And, and that disturbs me greatly. You are, um, 
a custodian of business. And I, I see myself, you know, all the way back to Green Cross days as a vet, a custodian of the individual business that serves that individual suburb. Um, and if you come with that view, then you work out what is the right model? How am I going to excite my people? How am I going to excite my customers? And then build a long, long legacy. And, and I'm going to use this quote from Jim Collins, the clockmaker versus the time teller, because I do love it. It's a, it's a great way to think about building business. And, and I guess, you know, I've got lots of mates that develop in real estate. I actually think about how I develop businesses. And Jim Collins's clockmaker versus time teller, quite simply, what happened if you met this guy? By looking at the stars or by looking at the sun, he could tell you the actual time, any time of the day. You'd be damn impressed, wouldn't you? So you meet the time teller and he does that. And then you met this next guy who builds an incredible clock, does never lose time from generation to generation. Who do you want to have in your team, the time teller or the clockmaker? Uh, the time teller, right? No, because no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you're impressed by the time teller because he's amazing. But the guy can build you a clock that keeps telling the time from generation to generation. That's far more exciting. And that's how I think about building a business that you put in a CEO or you're the founder and you build this amazing business. But when you go, it all starts to fall apart yeah. because you haven't put the right structures in place, the right platforms in place, the right culture in place. And the clock, clock maker is the same, that he's gone, long gone, dead, but generationally yeah. that clock still ticks over telling the right time. And that's, that's what we're trying to do in business, that when we're there, we're custodians to create platforms that, that move to the next generation, that can generate ideas, um, can, can monitor you know, key performance indicators that tell you how the business lag or lead is going, um, have culture, how to recruit, retain, educate, support, coach your people to the next generation and continue on. So you think about some of the best businesses globally, they're generational companies. You know, the Germans do it well, the Chinese do it well. You know, we have to think about being custodians and handing on the business with good pr processes, good systems, good culture that then keep reinventing themselves no matter what happens in the marketplace. Yeah, and creating a legacy, right? A legacy yeah. brand as opposed to one that crumbles as soon as management change or keeps getting traded. Um, I'm really fascinated by the, the whole idea of a generational company because I think Australia has, we have a few, but as you mentioned, a lot more in, in other markets. What oh, do you think that is? It's scary. We're, you know, Australia, we're, we're, a small, we're a small pool, yeah. absolutely. And you look at what our top, our top 10 companies in the world, I think what they've all been around since the 1930s. Yeah, they're banks and mining stocks, right? Exactly, and still here, yeah. you know, and whereas you look at the US, mm -hmm. they keep regenerating those those top companies, you know, yeah. Microsoft move in, Google's moved in, uh, you know, Facebook, um, the Alpha company, you know, that, so you start thinking, what are we doing? And we've got to get better at creating entrepreneurial companies. We're great at the innovation piece, they come up fast, but we've got to work out how to support them into the next generation. And that's that entrepreneurial piece. Yeah. And, you know, we can dig up dirt really well and, and ship overseas. Uh, but, you know, our big our big banks, uh, supermarkets, it's a duopoly yeah. or a quadruopoly in, in banks, of course. But it's working out how that we can bring them all the way up. and through. Yeah. It's, it's interesting because I think you've come from a background. Of, you, you were a vet, right? Yeah. yeah. And you started to say, well, I want to change my industry. And I think the best way to do that is by consolidating or rolling it up, whatever the term you use, but to build a bigger platform so you can continue the legacy, where I think people that from the outside look to do a roll up, they do it because they come from finance or private equity or an accountant like myself, <laughs> who see, wow, there is enormous money to be made here if we do it right. Yeah. Um, and I think that sometimes they, they don't see the, you know, the, the nuance or the vision that, that comes from a founder technician. Um, what's your take on that? Uh, look, uh, you've got to find founders that are willing to be coached. Yeah. And you've got to find private equity that, that, look, they are damn good as financial engineers and, and, and you know, accountants, accountants and, and people that come through merchant yeah, banking. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, look, I, deep respect, you know, how to do financial forecasts, how to get funding models right uh, is so important. And, and that collaboration and partnering is what I see as the right way to approach. Mm. Finding good partners, uh, sorry, good founders that are not narcissistic, yeah. that are deeply humble and respectful of, of other people's knowledge and learnings and can be coached is what you're looking for. Yeah. And, um, you know, we're, 
in, in Healthy Now, where, where uh, we looked to the future and we saw that the Australian stock exchange, the, the micro cap, small cap market, I think it's going to be depressed for the next year or two. Yeah, 100%. And, and we're trying to do stuff in healthier, grow platforms, grow a business, um, go overseas to the US and, and uh, buy orthotic labs. We're trying to, um, to continue with a massive pipeline of good physio practices and evolve them into multidisciplinary allied health locations. Um, our share price is too depressed to raise capital. We sure. raise capital, we get diluted. Um, so we had a long, hard look at that. We had plenty of private equity knocking at our door and we had deep conversations around partnering us to deliver um, the business plan. And that's why we've decided to go that way. In that process, of course, the strong conversation, you know, we're trading at 90, 95 cents uh, and we've got private equity willing to pay us $1.80. Mm. So, you know, the reality was that was about being fair about the value that we created in Healthier. Yep. The value that, that, you know, our shareholders expect. They, you know, we listed at a dollar. A dollar eighty is not a bad outcome. It's not the outcome we wanted, but it's a shitload better than 95 current, cents. Current, yeah, yeah. And, and I can't see us moving for the next year or two in small cap land and micro cap land. It's just going to be depressed. So the concept of partnering with, a, with private equity rather than public equity, it's not a hard extension as long as you have the right team. And you know, uh, Pacific Equity Partners are, are sen you know, exceptionally good team. We did a lot of background on them. Yep. They've done a few take privates in Ex their history. Be... Exactly, and they did a lot of work around us and um, we feel that look, there's a common ground we can work together. Yeah. You know, we, we want a robust debate about best use of capital yeah. and they're going to have a robust debate about how we operate that business to, to keep our people really engaged, delivering performance in each individual clinic, um, executing on the pipeline, having a look at the US and the, the ups and downs and the opportunities there. So, you know, we, we want a healthy debate. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. So from a, I guess, speaking from a finance lens, um, people are always exploring, well, how do, how do you create value through a roll-up or, or engineering this? So <laughs> typically there's, there's a play, typically this playbook like, well, there's a bunch of like SMBs, which are small, you know, family owned businesses who may not have the best operating practice. There's no consistency. I like processes or sophistication in the way they run their business. It's kind of like, you know, they've found the business 20 years ago and they've been doing the same, same thing for the, for the same way for a long time. Um, and so the idea is like, cool, I'm going to bunch a bunch of these vets together. Um, I'm going to put a consistent brand because they're all kind of got their own, like, you know, family brand, Andrew and Co, Vet Clinic, or the Mr. Richards uh, Vet Clinic down the road. Let's just create a, a nice franchisable brand, um, slap a logo on it, stick them all together. We're going to centralize all the costs because I've got, you know, we've got duplicate accountants and we've got duplicate HRP. We don't need any of those people. Let's put it all to a head office. And I guess the secondary benefit of that is that you de risk the key person risk, right? Which is, fundamentally the largest risk for any small businesses. Um, what, what else am I missing there? Because with, if you de-risk it, that you get multiple expansion, so we're for multiple expansions and you're paying, you, you get more a high valuation because there's less risk in the business, is that? Oh, look, I think fundamentally private equity or even as a public company, you go out and you keep buying up individual practices or individual businesses at a, because it's only one location and there's a lot of risk around that one location, yeah. you're buying them cheaper. Yes. Once you amass, you know, 50 to 100, you've got to get to a certain level because you've got to carry a corporate office. Yep. Uh, you are break even for a long time until you go through and watch and point. Yeah. yeah, that magic number that, that you're suddenly getting some, some benefit Start of. Start making money. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, you know, you're trying to buy small business from anywhere from, say, two times earnings to, to four and a half, five times earnings. Yep. Roll them in to the head entity. Yep. And because you've got a, a head entity that is de-risks across multiple locations, multiple geographies, multiple personalities, uh, you, you've got some synergies, maybe some buying power, some synergies out of your finance and payroll activities, some synergies out of marketing. You can drive more foot traffic because you get more bang for your buck out of your, your marketing, your dollar. All those things are beneficial. But the simplest, you know, good old days of the roll up is buy, a, say, two, three, four times earnings and you should be trading on seven, eight, nine, ten times earnings. And just by putting that business in overnight, you've, you've you know, doubled or tripled yep. or quadrupled its value. Yep. That's a roll. Amazing. Fantastic. Exactly. So the key is how do you maintain earnings and performance in that individual business as part of, say, 100, 200, 400 locations or 
um, you know, the way the business performs. So that is the, the magic source that, that I've spent a long time thinking about and how to get performance of your people. So yeah. culture is, is everything. You know, you, you've, you, you know, I've done plenty of workshops and listened to plenty of people on culture, but it's true. Once you can't interact with an individual employee on a day-to-day -day basis, then you've got to think about how do we get everyone aligned, thinking about the big vision of where we're going. Um, so core values, core ideology, a purpose, a mission is damn important. And, and it works out we're attracting people into our organisation that, that share our common goal. Yep. Uh, my, my number one job in Green Cross in, when I was the CEO was wandering around Australia, checking in on our people, ask them what do we want to start doing, stop doing and keep doing. So we're listening to them, ask the same question of our customers, start doing, stop doing, keep doing. It's a great Vern Harnish uh, quote there. Uh, from from uh, the one-page plan, yeah, scaling up. Mm -hmm. uh, and so my job then was culture. This is where we're going, guys. I, I understand you've got concerns, but we've got to spend some time developing an IT platform. We've got to spend some time developing a marketing uh, engagement plan. How do we get more foot traffic in? So give me time. Yeah. And the and, uh, first two years of Green Cross, we had no money. <laughs> we couldn't deliver any extra benefit of being involved with us. Yeah. But I had to convince them our people that give me time yeah. and, and healthy a bit has been the same. Fascinating. You know? so, so, that, so they're in backing you as the consolidator as well, I guess the... That you're authentic, give me time to get enough together yeah. so we can get then the scale that we need to get the best education programs, the best IT platforms, um, the best, you know, the, whatever that's going to look like to help your, your front line be able to do a better job for the, the patients, the clients, the customers. Makes perfect sense. And I guess that's, that's the common criticism with um, with these kind of roll-up businesses is because you, you need to sh still have organic growth within the portfolio of businesses, right? You can't just grow earnings and revenue just by attacking shitty businesses together. <laughs> Correct. And I used to say this all the time. Once you've learned how to operate the frontline business and you're getting performance, yeah. you've earned the right to buy more. You've earned the right to be to doing a roll-up. But, you know, I ran a very successful group of practices in Townsville. My co-founders ran successful practices in Brisbane and Melbourne. And we came together as co-founders of Green Cross, yeah. a team. And we had a strong view on how to run multi-site veterinary hospitals with no owner present. So we had some really good DNA in, in where we'd come from. And we used to share that knowledge and, and then moved into a, into a corporate model. And I still argue in any roll up, you're going, how do you drive performance of an individual business in the community it serves, and now um, how do you do that on multi-site, on mass? And, uh, and so many uh, consolidators fail because they forget the importance. You know, they just slam those EBITDAs together and it looks sexy until it falls over. Yeah, but they've made their money on the way out anyway. So correct, cares. <laughs> correct, correct. And, and I am always cynical and sceptical once I get in and do due diligence on stuff and yeah. you go, it's going to fall over. Yeah, yeah, interesting. And so, um, you know, Warren Buffett talks a lot about synergies being bullshit. Like, what's your take on that being taking an opposite view almost because that is really a key part of the role? It, it, look, it is. I, I think synergies are generally your bonus. That's your ice cream or your cream on top of the cake. Yeah. Um, you still got to fundamentally drive organic performance in those those businesses. Yeah. Uh, and then you might get some synergy out of, say, buying power. So, so in the Green Cross day, um, 30% of our income was from the sale of pharmaceuticals and um, we got another 10% out of the sale of product in the waiting rooms. Um, so you get some buying power there that then adds a couple of percentage points to your to your profit line, yeah. three, four, five percent at times. Um, synergies around buying insurance, synergies around buying education platforms uh, or you know materials to, to, and content. So all those things are a, a bonus, but you've got to remember you're carrying a head entity and a whole bunch of people in head office that work against you until you break through. And a lot of roll-ups never break through. They, they never get to scale where the head office uh, justifies its existence. Yeah, yeah. So back to the, the PE in the list, the public versus private model. So now Green Cross, that got taken private by TPG. Healthy is currently in the process of being taken private by PEP. Like how, in your experience working with TPG, how has working with private equity being different to working in current, I guess, the, the current public market model? Like, what are they, how are they running the business differently? Because they need to have some sort of edge or, you know, rationale to why we can, while we're partnering with uh, with you, then 
the market, right, or the public market? Yeah, look, a good private equity house will not just go and rip costs out. They are going in and going, where are there inefficiencies that don't make sense? Yeah. Justify why you're doing those things. And, uh, you know, I, I know things happened after I left Green Cross that disturbed me greatly. Well, we're four years on, they're now trying to reinstate stuff that, that they ripped out because mm. the accountants took the wrong view. Right. And uh, the internal team couldn't justify. Sure. Or couldn't couldn't justify the you know the, the toe cutters, what, what they were supposed to do. So it's back to the future for some of the things they're doing there. Um, but a good private equity house will robustly debate why you're doing things and you've got to justify it. Yep. Have the data points and and because most most private equity People are, you know, they've come through merchant banking. They're big on analysis and data points and unit economics. And so you've got to be able to justify why you're doing things. Yep. Um, you know, things like um, having a, you know, and healthier, we do it really well, a graduate program. We go into the universities, open up all our clinics for, for clinical prac work for university students doing physio, podiatry, optometry. We then throw out, a, you know, an open up for the graduate program and we put about 150 people into our business every year through the graduate program. Um, and at first glance, that costs you money mm. for a while until you get those graduates productive. And then they come flying out the other end a year or two later, so much more productive than clinicians that, that uh, have not been through the program. So, yeah. so how, to, how to be a great clinician on, at all fronts. Yeah. You know, not manage, just the technical. Yeah, not just cl the clinical side, but managing your time, um, how, to, how to rebook a patient. Yeah. You know, the things that are important that, that add to the, to the value to the lives of your patient. Yeah. So that stuff's important um, and you've got to convince and, and, and uh, justify you know, and show you your numbers. So it's almost that they act as kind of a, a bigger brother in the sense that they'll keep you in check. You have to justify the cost as opposed to just the executive team having kind of tunnel vision perhaps and just doing things what they think is in best interest of everyone. Correct. And look, I, I've gone from being that operator CEO to probably being more, far more strategic and far more looking more like a private equity person myself yeah. with, with you know, investing in founders and helping scale up their businesses. So I get it from both sides now. And, um, you know, I think some of the fights I had in the Green Cross boardroom and, and uh, afterwards, I have a far more mature view now that uh, I'd probably be a little bit gentler and less robust around the debates and probably more convincing because of data and, and less emotional. Uh, and, and that's important. So I'm looking forward to working with, with uh, Pep. I think they're going to be a great team. Um, they're bringing a lot of smarts from a lot of industries into our boardroom. Um, at the same time, they want to collaborate. They want a partnership. They see some strengths in, or a lot of strengths in how we approach Allied Health. Yep. Um, and so that they won't come in and just, you know, decimate the place as some private equity houses do. You, yeah. You've just got to, you know, have that, have that good robust debate on, on what's working and what's not. Yeah. Um, and, and convince, um, I guess, those who control the capital, be it people like me and private equity houses, that's a smart decision. Yeah, makes sense. And so um, how much strategy are they, like, like how much, because they're, they're working from, so, so most of them outsiders to an industry, they're starting industry, they kind of understand where healthier in this instance sits in the, in the broader category. Um, how much strategic overlay are they giving to the board? Like do they dictate strategy or they work collaboratively with the executive team or the board on, on some instances? Look, I think it's probably how I think. I, I ask the question, you think you, you can acquire 10 clinics a year, why couldn't we acquire 30? Yeah. You know, what's the pain points on integration, on culture, on, you know, changing IT platforms over, all those things. So, so can we do that smoother and more efficiently? Do we need a slightly bigger team to assist with integration? Um, and not get ahead of the curve and you know put more costs in, uh, but we can go a little faster with, yeah. without damaging um, delivery of service to patients, without damaging you know culture and, and engagement of our people and delivering education platforms or whatever. So, you know a lot of a lot of how we think about a roll up is getting the pace right, uh, making sure that the team can integrate and support on a, on an ongoing basis, um, and look private equity. That quite simply, um, I keep saying it. When when they get it wrong, when the f it's it's often because they got the wrong founders that they're backing. Mm. That the founders are, are, are you know, high guns. As yeah, yeah. Let's just go out and go hard. Like yourself, yeah. Yeah, and yeah. go. And, and the other one is you can go slow. Yeah. You know, it's okay to go steadily, 
in the approach and rather than just a quick smash and grab and yeah. and, and here's a beautiful thing wrapped up and, and let's let's now exit. Yes. Um, I have a lot more respect for founders that are that are, you know, can work with with either public or private money and, you know, do it slowly, methodically and the right way. Yeah. And there's some great illustrations of of you know, people doing it well in a lot of industries. Yeah, yeah makes sense. And so TPG, they they merged. It was a pet pet brands or pet farm. Oh, oh, I, forget, I forget the name. There's a few of them around now. I was I was a, a director and a shareholder of uh, Mammoth Holdings, which was Pet Barn yeah. and City Farmers and uh, Animates in New Zealand. Um, on my board was uh, we, we had some guys in the Pet Barn team as well as uh, Jeff and I on the Green Cross board, and, and I was operating Green Cross. And we had a long-term view that, that we could look after the pet owner from cradle to grave, from retail to professional service, grooming, vet, um, after hours, emergencies, um, specialist services and retail mm. and do it really well. Yeah. So we then logically had this debate in both boardrooms to merge the two businesses together. Green Cross was listed, Pet Barn uh, was private, uh, it was sitting, sitting, uh, and we did have TPG in originally as our private equity uh, in in Pet Barn, uh, and then we rolled all that together. Yeah, so that makes sense because it's, a, it's talking about value creation opportunities, like moving from I guess a professional services or you know health business into a more of a retail model. That yep. makes perfect sense. Do you see a similar playbook capping with healthier potentially. Look, like we're, 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 we're I'm thinking about the ideas like because OPSM is like a retail uh, optometry brand. Like, could you? Oh, yeah. cool, we'll have healthier kind of department stores or retail uh, chain. Look, we have, we have 50 odd optometry clinics yeah. now. Uh, so we do do retail and uh, we do work out how to support our optometrists and lead with professional clinical activity with retail alongside it rather than retail as the leader in optometry. It's, it's, a, it's a, you know, got to do really professional optometry. Yeah. Um, look, there are a lot of learnings there. You don't manage your clinicians the same way you manage retail staff. Yeah. And, and that's sort of, what we didn't do well in Pet Barn and Green Cross. Yeah, we, we had a, a, a retail lens trying to apply that to a, to a professional services yep. play. Yep. And uh, we had a lot of robust debates about the best approach. Um, we thought coexistence and collaborating was the best way. Yep. Um, our CEO at the time thought just smash it together into one company was better. Um, I didn't have a mortgage on all the best ideas, but I just didn't think that was the right way to go. And anyway, we smashed it together, lost a lot of our uh, really good um, middle to upper management teams yeah. in both camps because we just couldn't quite get the culture fitting nicely, mm. uh, which was sad. But anyway, it, our, our share price tanked. Uh, TBG came along and offered a sensible price. We thought that was probably the right thing to do to get it back on track, delist it and, and let another owner get all the things we were hoping to do originally back on track. Yeah. And I think they have done a good job of that. Yeah, that makes sense. And I think that we've seen that in other industries, like the health retail, like um, pharmacies, I guess, a great example, right? They start the pharmacy. I'm still surprised at how, you know, you walk into a pharmacy and they sell everything, shampoo to, to you know, de deodorant and perfume, whatever. And then, but I'm actually here to buy whatever, right? <laughs> and, and, I'm, I'm here to see the specialists, not I only be sold freaking hair gel. Like. No, and, it's, and it is interesting, the pharmacy market, you know, keep an eye on it, is, is drifting up towards, you know, wellness and, and a bit of sickness, you know, being able to give vaccines in, yep. in a pharmacy. Yep. Yep. So they're becoming, you know, start to nibble away at Even the at Woolies, GP. Yeah, yeah, Woolies as well. Like they're, they're offering, you know, they're, I think they're offering, I was talking about offering COVID jabs and things like that. Um, where, where they're allowed to, I'm not sure in Queensland, but de definitely around. Yeah. So, so, you know, pharmacies coming further up from being retailers and sellers of prescription medications to selling services. Yeah. So it's intriguing to watch, um, you know, high margin when you're selling services. Mm -hmm. So that combination makes a lot of sense if, if you can get round, your head around it. Yeah, because I guess that the retail is, is the foot traffic and then you sell them the more premium services, which, you know, that, Correct. that makes perfect sense. Uh, which is, you know, the, the Green Cross model, incredibly powerful when you've got a funnel with pet barn driving massive amount of foot traffic. It, you know, they, they do merchandising and pet retail the best in Australia by a long way. And that then filters through to the GP clinics, which then filters into the emergency and, and um, specialty centres. And you know, we did a great job, robust model, uh, and, and TPG are doing a great job supporting it. Yeah, I think sometimes that could be the criticism of, of turning everything into a big box model because you know I, I go to a vet uh, for my, my dog Bella, she's nine, and you know, we see our vet regularly, but it's one of those 
small family clinics at Stones Corner, actually. Just, it's a small, I think the owners are still the proprietors. Uh, sorry, the, the, yeah, the founders of the proprietors still um, have their own brand and they're yeah. great. It's a great experience. It's a personal experience. I think that the risk with going big box is that you're just a number of a, a customer and don't get that personal connection anymore. Exactly. And, and look, with Healthier, as allied health professionals, we are very aware of that. Yeah. And that's why you still see a lot of local brands still existing. So the house of brand, um, we're acutely aware that, that you have your favourite physio, your favourite podiatrist, your favourite optometrist, your favourite yeah. OT, your, yeah. your favourite psychologist, um, and making sure that that's core yeah. to the relationship with yeah. the patient and then working out how to support around that. So things like education, marketing, you know, do the payroll finance, all that normal stuff. But, but you know, that, that is so important that the, the, the goodwill is still attached to the team professional service, the technician yeah. or the clinician in this instance. Yeah, exactly. And uh, and freeing them up yeah. in a roll up, you free them up to focus on developing the team and and uh, customer service yeah. and customer experience. So Glenn, professional services business ha businesses have certain nuances that make them a bit more potentially challenging relative to other type uh, businesses which uh, could be rolled up because they're selling like products or goods as opposed to personalized services. So mm. to give you some context, you know, I'm, a, I'm an accountant. Uh, I, my previous firm I used to work at was WHK Horworth, which was a listed roll up of accounting firms. And I kind of saw firsthand how, um, you know, how, how what can go wrong or what could not go maybe in the right way with regards to incentives. So what I observed was basically WHK, they raised a bunch of capital, bought a bunch of accounting businesses, stuck them all together, listed it and uh, they were taken private um, not long <laughs> afterwards. But what I noticed specifically from the principals who got bought out, you know, you're thinking, you know, 55 year old kind of practitioners who have run their own business for, you know, 20 years odd, they get cushed out at a four times multiple. So they're probably sitting on, you know, a couple of mil at least or two or $3 million. And that's it. I call, I've sold my business, I've achieved my career success, um, made my money. And suddenly they take their foot off the pedal a little bit in a list environment because they're on a fixed salary. Um, they're not really driven to, to grow uh, the, the, the revenue or the profits or maybe deliver a level of customer experience, which they previously did, 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 sorry, they previously did because there's a brand kind of protecting them now. So how do you keep, in professional service businesses specifically, how do you keep these folks incentivized once you bought them? But first, a quick message from our sponsor. Are you tired of traditional accounting firms that only focus on tax and compliance? Looking for a financial partner that can go beyond the numbers and reveal the story those numbers are telling? SBO Financial aren't your typical business accountants. We're your dedicated financial management team, empowering you to take control of your finances and gain clarity and confidence in your business. Sure, it will keep your books in order and file your taxes. But unlike traditional firms, we'll also go beyond financial hygiene to give you the forward-looking insights and strategies you need to grow your cash and profitability. Picture this, a team of chartered accountants, CPAs, bookkeepers, payroll specialists, and financial analysts all working together to help you grow your business. With SBO, you gain access to a collective team of experts and specialists, providing you with proactive advice and analysis. So don't settle for reactive advice. Stop looking backwards and start looking forwards with SBO Financial, your partner in financial management and growth. Visit our website or contact us today for a free financial health check at sbo.financial. Yeah, interesting. So if I tell you too much, I'm, I'm uh, divulging my secret sauce. Aren't oh, I? <laughs> I this is stock data numbers. We yeah, need to, yeah, to yeah. Get, get to the... Well, the look, Green, Green Cross days, we were buying out the old vets that were tired, that had enough and they wanted to cash out. Um, so it was a succession plan roll up. Yes. Um, funny enough, you know, I was there for eight years and 72% of our clinics still had the old vendor working in it rather than working the, the 50, 60 hours they used to, they're back to 20, 30 hours. So that, that importance of that old clinician is so wise and supportive and then slowly elevate the next young vet um, was important. Um, we used a thing called the Business Associate Program where they could buy basically management rights. Um, so if they grew profit, they got a, a share of profit growth yep. on a multiplier. So it was sort of a probably phantom best, equity type thing. Yeah, it's sort of phantom equity glorified bonus scheme, which worked reasonably well. Um, but what I did see was there were four or five clinics that said, look, I'm going to leave 
if I can't buy in as a percentage holder in that individual clinic. Yeah. And we did four or five deals that I had to convince the board that that's what I needed to do to hold. You know, these guys were mid forties, they're very accomplished. Yeah. So I didn't want to lose that DNA, that IP, the intellectual property associated with those people. And the goodwill, but you see goodwill walking out the door literally, right? Very goodwill, very productive people. Yeah. You know, yeah. They, they were cornerstone of the practices. So, so I saw that. When we, when we move on and think about other professional services, um, it's got to be the right model for the right reasons. So to some degree, you're doing a roll up in accounting, optometry, physio, GP clinics, dentistry. I've done it in a lot of industries. Yeah. I've been involved alongside, backed, however you want to look, but I'm, you know, privy to what, what's been going on internally. And I still think you've got to come up with a model that makes sense where the older clinicians are allowed to, to fade out because a lot of them don't just want to stop working overnight. Yeah. They actually still get a lot of enjoyment if they if you take a lot of the, the stuff that they don't enjoy out of out of their day, which is managing HR issues, trying to recruit, um, dealing with, with customer complaints, uh, you know, all those things that you, you try and quietly move so they end up just focusing on turning up and doing 20, 30 hours a week, highly productive, enjoy being clinicians, but yet they're getting three, four days a week up, up at their, their beach house or with their grandkids or whatever else. So coming up with a model that makes sense. So with Healthier, um, we introduced from day one a co-ownership model. A, um, so basically a partnership. So we are the corporate partner with the local clinic, clinician. And we maintained that and still maintain that today. Um, every clinic we buy, um, we go looking for who's going to partner with us hmm, in that location. Uh, because we know that there is strength in having a lead clinician yep. that is the partner. Um, and, or, and a lot of our physio practices have at least two to three partners on location. Yep. So that has been absolutely important in maintaining performance. Uh, then we provide a framework around that um, education platform, coaching. Um, so our regional partners become regional coaches. So they go in, pick up all the best ideas across the platform, across all our clinics yep. and create venues and forums where those ideas can be shared and then help coach those great ideas into, into the individual clinics. So the argument is, and it's probably not unlike a fr you know, thinking about franchisees, you know, they're high, high maintenance, your job as a fr you know, franchise or is to try and inspire, coach, and get the best performance in individual locations. And we take, a, a, in the collaboration partnership model that we do at Healthier, our job is to coach and support, not to manage gotcha. and, and dictate. Yeah. These are, you know, clinicians and professional service people are really, really intelligent people. So we need to inspire and, and influence, not manage. Yeah, that and makes sense. And when you start managing people, you've lost it. So, you, you know, so core values, core ideology, a vision of where you're taking the business is important in how you converse with, with people that are you know, highly intelligent. And you don't, uh, keep coming, you don't manage them, you coach them. Yeah. And, and you coach on what other people are doing. You know, here's our highly successful practices. This is why they are highly successful. So, so I could say, so, so I'm an optometrist. I say, hey, Healthy has approached me. He's like, hey, come join our platform or community of other yep. people like you who, and you know, your business could be, you have a great business, but you'll only get so far by yourself. Come with us, join our. You totally de-risk it for the next generation. Yeah. Because you, they buy in alongside a corporate partner. Yep. Corporate partners are going to make sure that business never goes broke. Of course, that makes sense. And then they've got access to greater resources, yep. uh, you know, shared knowledge between other practitioners and they're all working towards the same goal. So how, how much how much equity are these people keeping typically? Oh, look, typically we work on about 30% gotcha. on okay. in location yeah. and the corporate partners 70%. Okay. And, and the importance of that is, you know, you bring a lot of value, you bring funding, you yeah. bring, you know, scale around buying equipment, product, whatever. Uh, you bring education platforms, you bring coaches, uh, you bring all that, that KPI, uh, key performance indicators that, that, that optimise performance of each practice. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. And the, okay, and then you're, so you're buying them out and then you do still control the cash flows of the, the business? So like, are they, every a salary and then they'll get a dividend? So Correct, yeah. yeah. So every, every practice has an individual P&L and, and um, everyone gets um, equivalent of a, 
you know, personal exertion salary, and then there's the dividend based around the performance or the EBITDA of the practice. Makes sense. And you're using debt typically to acquire these these yeah. clinics? Yeah. 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 What's the, what's the appropriate use of leverage for, for roll-ups? Because I think another criticism of PE is that you just you deliver them too high and you've got so much debt in the balance sheet that sometimes the cash flows don't support. Yeah. Look, I, I, in public markets, we, we try and sit, you know, one and a half to two and a half debt to EBITDA. Okay. So, yeah, and, so. And, and, and you don't want to go over about 2.2. Um, private equity, look, they can push the balance sheet a bit harder, yeah. but within reason. And, and, and again, exactly what you're saying. If you push it too hard, then all you're doing is, yeah, rolling from, from you know, the next, the next, you know, numbers to the next numbers. And you don't want to be in that position. Yeah. When you're buying and doing a really good model and with the right people and you're supporting your people well, you're getting performance in your individual locations. Uh, and that all adds up to you know being able to continue to acquire more because you've got free cash flow. Yep. You throw a bit of debt in, and you keep you know rolling along. So that's a compound it. Yep. Awesome. Um, so we're going to switch gears. So I I've been studying roll ups in, in various industries because I'm just again I'm a finance stalk. I love analysing companies, yep. and um, you know I noticed that there's kind of five in key ingredients to a successful roll up. Um, most roll ups have one to three of these ingredients, um, which generally will drive above above average returns for investors, you know, risk adjusted. Um, and so I'm just going to kind of go through these ingredients with you and then you can you know, critique me and tell me what your thoughts. So the first one's a fragmented industry. Like you need to have enough of these small businesses to buy and consolidate. Yep. Um, so lots of mum, ideally lots of mum and dad pop shop kind of family business owners um, have to be a lot of targets available to, to merge. Um, and yeah, and typically, because they're smaller, you can get them at a good price, you know, that, that three to four or two to four that you were talking about. So that's the first one, fragmented industry, which would be better in a bigger box model or a bigger brand, right? Yep. Second one needs to be a strong platform. You need to have a really strong executive team or a management team that knows the industry well, ideally insiders that know the nuances or whatever, not Correct. just people coming in from the outside. Yep. Uh, economies of scale. So ideally, if, you know, five is better than one or one plus one equals three, that type of idea that you can get buying power or um, there's more value to the customer because there's a bigger share of, of the same kind of green cross as an example. If I'm, I'm in Brisbane, I've got a, my, my dog Bola goes to one, I can go, if I relocate to Sydney, I know that the green cross in Sydney will know my dog as well as the guys in Brisbane, right? So there's some value to the customer. Correct. Through scale. Um, the next one's constrained supply. So ideally what you're doing is tapping in a market where there's some barriers to entry into getting it. So by buying more of those businesses, you're essentially eating the supply. You're, you're buying it all up. So you take market share through supply constraints. Um, I think there's a challenge where there's industries with low barriers to entry is that, well, anyone can increase the supply. Um, so that erodes, the, I guess, the value created through, through a roll up. So there's that fourth amount. And the last one's a network effect. So this is rare to see, but sometimes can be seen where, and so network effect in experience like Facebook is an example of network effect, that the more users on Facebook, the more valuable the, the platform comes to for Facebook, but also the end user, right? Because yep. there's more friends, I can communicate with them. So ideally there'll be some form of network effect in, in, a, in a roll up model where um, because there are there's a bigger network of vet clinics of the same, that increases the value of, of me for a customer. So yep. there's incentive for the customer to use Green Cross, an example. So they're my five. Anything I'm missing? No, I think that's fairly accurate, Jason. I, I, look, you know, at the end of the day, it's, 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 it's got to be the right model that you're applying. Yeah. And if you get it wrong, you're a retailer trying to do it in professional services or a professional services, you, you miss that high detail retail. This is how you do it. Science, you know, you, you got to get it right. Yeah, yeah, cool. So I'm gonna I'm gonna change this. I'm gonna pitch you uh, <laughs> an industry that I think is right for a roll up, and yep. then you can be, you know, the Shark Tank, Glenn Richards, and uh, critique me or challenge me or tell me shreds of why you think it's a stupid idea. Yep. Um, and then vice versa, I'd love you to pitch me an idea or present an industry you think is is uh, suitable for a roll up. Right. So I'm gonna start <clears throat> car washes. Right, so car washes, there's no, why well, I like it, like I, I, so just a bit of backstory why I've been looking at car washes. Um, I, when I was younger, I, at school, a little bit entrepreneurial, and say, so I wouldn't call myself an entrepreneur, but I was interested in making money. Um, and vending machines were like a thing I was really into. I think at, at some stage, entrepreneurs, any, or every entrepreneur has looked at vending machines or some of this automatic cash generating thing that or an asset, right? And uh, vending machine, my, my high school, 
um, didn't sell soft drinks. I thought, oh, cool. Why isn't someone just set up a vending machine that sells soft drinks in my high school, right? There's a big pool of people who love sugar and junk food and I own the market, a bit of passive income. Uh, later I learned that it was illegal for the school. It was in their policy to serve junk food for a reason because of obesity and things like that. So, but I, got, I went down this rabbit hole of like vending machines as this kind of passive cash flow generating thing, which actually led me to car washes, so at a larger scale. Vending machines now were just too subscale for me. Um, they would generate maybe two or three grand of profit every year, but I'm looking for like $300,000 of profit every year and given the opportunity cost of what I could earn in my current businesses. So car washes. So what I like about them, um, fragmented industry, there is no, think of a car wash brand. Yeah. Can't think of one, right? So that's the first Do reason. Dollar wash or something like that. Yeah, um, I can't think. What is that? Is that one? That you, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. That probably the probably <laughs> is it all washed somewhere in the western suburbs of Sydney. Who knows, right? But there's my point is there's no franchise brand at the moment. Right. Second is the, uh, my research. I, I did a big rabbit hole of this, a deep dive on it. There's no um, common owner. Like there's no. It hasn't been rolled up before. Pretty mm -hmm. much like a lot of uh, mum and dad in um, owners of these car washes, typically baby boomers, um, and the industry secret is it's like the best best business to own in Australia. Like insiders of car washes don't like to tell, show off how much money they make because they think that, well, anyone can do this because it's so simple. Don't tell anyone. It's kind of, um, so there's that. Um, they're predictable. So there's recurring revenue. Everyone needs a car wash. Most people use car washes. Um, constrained supply. Usually buildings of car washes are built fit for purpose, right? Mm -hmm. You can't just, you can't, you can't just buy, uh, you know, a bit of commercial lease and turn into a car wash, right? You need to have infrastructure of, the water, you know, the size, the building, etc. Yeah. Right. So they're built for purpose, which means constrained supply, right? Um, and yeah, that, and they're good businesses. So I looked at the download IMs of a few car washes. You know, a lot of them, some of them are spinning out, you know, thirty to forty percent cash flow, mm. uh, EBITDA cash flow margins every year. Uh, so, 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 and re return on capital? What's yeah? Well, that's the, the prices. So you know, they sell. Let's just say you buy one for a mill. They're, they're pumping out two to three hundred k of cash flow. Um, so, the, you know, from a tax perspective, you can write off a lot of that for, yep. because the buildings is good, which actually a lot of people don't think about when they look at buying services businesses. It's mostly it's goodwill that you're buying. <clears throat> Where in more capex intensive businesses, you're actually buying a big chunk of land of buildings so you can depreciate that yep. shelves for tax, as a tax shield. Yep. Um, so that's a, anyway, I won't go into the nerd of that, but I won't nerd out on that too much. But um, the capex, ongoing capex is a big thing when you're buying capital intensive businesses, but they're actually pretty capital light. Once you've, because you're buying the thing, there's, there's maintenance and things that need to be upgraded, but they're not a huge constraint on cash. And the employees are pretty low uh, maintenance. I would have thought, you know, they're not technicians that you don't have to put them through a TAFE or a, or a university. Correct. Yeah. Most of them that I looked at, they had some sort of manager who is kind of like an injury vet, industry veteran. They're kind of handy. They can fix things here and there, you know, they're half decent customer service, but you don't need geniuses or rocket scientists to, to yeah. run a car wash. Yep. Yep. Um, no, I, li I like it. Um, so it's probably back to seeing the numbers and the cash flow and, and how many available. And, uh, and then, uh, you know, if they are good at generating cash and people use a lot of cash, then who else is looking at them? And are you going to run into uh, people you don't want to run into as other business owners like bikies or, or you know? So yeah, well, that's it. The mention, funny you mentioned bikies, like bikies love car washes. And I... I learned this in my research, I showed a few people who own car washes and they were like, yeah, um, bikies love them because they're still literally used to wash cash, which yep. why a lot of them still use cash to uh, take payments, which is crazy. I, I thought that was just like a, you know, uh, a Walter White type scenario, but it's, it's a real thing. <laughs> yeah, well, I might leave you doing the roll up in car washes. Then. <laughs> <laughs> Probably get stabbed or something. Yeah, uh, but, to... but look, that's exactly what you're after. So when you've got capital, you, you can add value. Uh, you're buying fairly, you know, the average punter probably can't find a million bucks. Yep. So that's a little bit of a barrier to entry. Yep. Um, maintenance capex. So if, you know, once you've built your bay, your bays and you're, you're probably just replacing pumps and you're doing lower end costs, yep. um, it'll be a real estate play. So best locations obviously win, easy access and easy in and out. out. Yep. Probably okay with the council, so regulations you're probably getting around. So all those things you're going through, 
uh, and therefore it's it's then a, a network play, a you know a, a land grab. Yeah, land grab. And I think yeah, the one thing I didn't mention was that there's a shift in the business model. So in the US, it's very popular for car washers to to move into a subscription. You know, pay sixty bucks a month, and you'll get unlimited washes. So yeah. if you could buy a few um, in different suburbs, you know, build a platform where pay 60 bucks a month, use whatever car wash you want. So that's an incentive for the customer to subscribe to your car wash. And then the other piece is to convert them away from cash because most yeah. most consumers don't want that. They just want to come and tap exactly and pay. Right. Yeah. And, and uh, if you're doing subscription or tap and pay models, that that's preference. Cause no, no one has cash on them anymore. No, exactly, yeah. We're becoming more of a cashless society. Uh, yeah, so yeah, I don't, yeah, things on legs? Yeah, I think so. You, you, you know, how many can you buy? How many out there? Um, you know, mum and dad, own them, therefore, do they want to sell them or they just want to keep them? Um, yeah, I like it. The, you know, put put together the team. Let me know when I'm, I'm pitch me the investment. I want Done. to see. I want to see the financial model. Uh, you'll get a beautiful one. Trust <laughs> me on that one. <laughs> Good. All right. What have you got, Glenn? Uh, look, I, I gave this some thought because you you did warn me before I came in that I had to give this some thought. So you know, I'm already in Allied Health, so I'm not going to chew my own lunch. <laughs> um, I like I like optometry, uh, but there are a couple of big players there that are. Uh, you know, doing a lot of discounting, so therefore you're taking on the, the big guys. So try and stay out of the way of two industry domination. You know, if you're not first or second, then then it's damn hard. Yeah. Uh, so you give that some thought. Um, so you know, I thought about hairdressers, and, and I have I have lost money in a hairdressing roll up. Okay. <laughs> uh, but I think I think it was done not quite right. Uh, I think if you work out how to incentivise your key couple of hairdressers. Um, and, and give them an opportunity to be equity owners, um, have some vertical integration around the retail play. So all those hair products and whatever, you know, the price attack, obviously they're already doing yeah. it quite well. Yeah. Uh, but do it as a, as a roll up rather than a franchise roll out. Yep. It's, that's the, the nuance difference. Storage, I gave that some thought. Self-storage? Self-storage. I also looked at self-storage. Big yeah. in the US, who used the self I didn't, I didn't think it was a big market in Australia as I thought. Uh, still pretty good, still yeah. pretty good because you know when you can't find places to rent, you are moving in with your parents or True. your friends and you need self-storage. Yeah, so, so that moving might, into, everyone's moving to apartment living nowadays. Yeah, and you have, have a storage unit that you pay a bit of extra against you know, and you're living in an apartment. So yeah. that, one's, that one's worth thinking about. Um, what, why didn't you? Pursue that, or like, because there's like I looked at it. There's like national storage, and there's a, there's a few like REITs as well. Yeah, like yeah, yeah. Like listed companies. So there's already established players, and, and some good value buying in public markets on the on the REITs. Exactly right. So it's got, well, I could. That, that's what I came to. Is like, well, I can, if I want exposure to um, self storage, I just I should just buy the shares, right? Yeah, <laughs> correct. And and that's a good point to make. That go and have a look at micro cap and small cap yeah, public yeah. markets. Yeah. They're incredibly good value at yeah, the moment. They are with roll ups that are going on that that managed to get a listing away in the last you know, four or five years, they're now copying it in the neck on their value, but they're still delivering. So, you know, that's that's a good point to make. Yeah. Do you have to do it yourself or you just go in alongside, you know. Yeah, people found, who've done this before. Yeah, yeah, they, for they, a while. yeah, they're delivering it. They're just not, you know, not valued well. Yeah. Um, I, you know, it's, it's still back to, I gave it some thought about mechanics. I did have a bit of a look at uh, crash repair roll-ups years ago. Yeah. Again. Wrong way, wrong people for the wrong reasons, I think, blow these things up and give everyone else a bad taste and go, just can't work. Yeah. Whereas you, you do it the right way, find the right founders that are coachable, um, introduce and support the capital side, um, the funding model and, and how to think about that business financially into the future. What capital does it need? Because often mums and dads run out of dough or, or, or you know they're pulling too much money out and not putting enough back into the business. So put some capital back in they grow faster. Yep. Um, so, you know, there's some of the value of, of adding roll-up. So, um, you know, mechanic, enrolling up a whole bunch of mechanical, you know, the, the second tier shops and going, look, you stay owner, we'll work out how to bring your apprentices up and in the future they'll they'll buy out that piece that you still own. Yep. And, you know, I do like my my healthier partnership model, co corporate partner with a with a local partner and you both bring value to the party. And, and there's a deep respect on that value you bring. The roll-ups fire when, when you know, the, the founders or the, the lead consolidator forgets the importance of the people that work the front line. Yeah. And you've got to have deep respect of how do you engage and enable those people in the front line better. Um, and, and I do like your thinking around less people and more and more sites where, you know, 
your, your car wash makes sense because it's a couple of people, yeah. but the but it does its thing. The value is the product yeah. as opposed to the server, the personal service, yeah. right? So it's you know thinking about IT mm. uh, services. Yeah, it's big big at the moment. A lot of people are like I've noticed that legal firms, accounting firms, and IT services are big in like you know, sniffing around PE or sniffing around those industries. Exactly. So, you know, from my point of view as a as a uh, investor coming up with something that makes sense, grow them up to where you hand them on to the next player. Yeah. Uh, as long as they're good custodians. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Yeah. Um, I like the mechanic idea. I think that, so I use, you know, I've Prado, I, so I go to the, the Toyota dealership and, you know, they're all right. They're pretty they're pretty good. Um, but I, I've learned about, so one of our sales teams at SBO, um, the, our BDM, he was ex, he's a car dealership guy. So he knows everything about the industry. And, you know, the gross margins on selling cars are like horrendous. They're like, Small, aren't sub ten percent. Yeah, it's like how does anyone make money? And it's like, well, they don't. They don't make money in the cars. They make money on the insurance, the finance, and then but the servicing. Yeah, um, that is revenue stream. That's long tail because it's recurring revenue. Everyone needs your car service. Hence why you get emails every place six months from <laughs> from the dealership. So exactly, I like the mechanic idea because if you can again build in that level of customer service and experience, but in a more kind of personal boutique model, and and, and still within you know local suburbs, so you don't yeah. have to drive too far. Yeah. And you work out how to support your local team, mechanic, lead mechanic, and, and apprentices, and, and and then you can you know move apprentices around between businesses when they're ready. They take over. You know we might be getting this completely wrong, and a mechanic will ring up and <laughs> yeah, like you're, you know, you, you're gonna do, you're, you're gonna do your dough. So <laughs> so you know it, it's back to industry insiders marrying up with people with capital yeah. and having really robust discussions around the best use of that capital and how to operate those business efficiently and effectively. And, and uh, you get it right and get the right team together, it's really powerful. And, and I, you know, I still come back to, um, I don't care what industry it is, if you get the business model right to get the right engagement, the right culture, the right support, the right platforms going in, um, you know, it does make sense. Great. I thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. Thank you, Glenn. Thank you, Jason. Thoroughly enjoyed it as well. Epic. And uh, well, where can people find you if they want to learn more about roll-ups and uh, ETA <laughs> and things like that? Uh, look, LinkedIn is the best place. I, I do probably two or three times a week jump on and answer my messages on LinkedIn. Yeah, perfect. Great. All right. Thank you, Glenn. Thanks, Jason. If you enjoyed this episode, I love it if you could take a moment and uh, leave us a review on your favorite podcast platform. We've got plenty more episodes coming your way, so make sure you subscribe on your app of choice. You can also find more financial insights at starknakednumbers.com or follow me on LinkedIn. Thanks for listening. I'm Jason Andrew, and this has been the Stark Naked Numbers podcast.